Hello, welcome to Goodnight Flagstaff. I'm John Eastwood, and as a father and grandfather, I've always enjoyed reading aloud. Thank you for tuning in to our community story time. You can find a new chapter from one of our favorite family-friendly books at 8 p.m. each weeknight on the Literacy Center's YouTube channel and on Crater Radio, a local online radio station. The previous chapter is replayed on Crater Radio each weeknight at about 7.45, just before the new chapter airs. You can also listen to all previous Goodnight Flagstaff recordings on YouTube. We are currently reading Race to the Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. If you'd like to check it out to read along with us at home, it is available in the Hoopla app with your Coconino County Library card. Check out a copy today. Uh, please, email me, please email us if you'd like to join our team of readers and connect with your community through stories. All ages of readers are welcome. Our email is goodnightflagstaff at gmail.com. Last time we read together... Nijoni is hurt when Max says she's crazy and he doesn't believe her about Mr. Charles. So she lets, so she tells Davery everything and he actually listens to her and even wants to help her research her family during Ancestor Club. And now, chapter 10. Operation, break some rules. I somehow make it through the morning's classes, although all I can think about is Mr. Charles, my mom, and my weird Mr. Yazzie dream. Well, that should be all I can think about, but the truth is, by 10.30 a.m., my mind is focused only on food, because in my hurry to get out the door, not only did I skip breakfast, but I forgot to grab my lunch of leftovers from the kitchen counter. By the time the bell rings at 11.45 a.m., my stomach is making rude noises and visions of ravioli are dancing in my head. With no bag lunch and no money for school lunch, I'll be stuck eating Davery's super healthy sawdust special, and that is just not going to work for me. Whatever the opposite of mouthwatering is, that's what my mouth starts doing whenever I think of his cookies. We are strictly prohibited from leaving school during the day except in the case of emergency. And even then, you have to be signed out by a parent. But I can't think of a bigger emergency than getting a decent lunch. And there's no way I'm calling my dad to have him come and sign me out. He's probably out in the field doing a survey anyway, and cell service can get spotty in the wilds of New Mexico. Even if I could get through to his phone, he'd be too far away to come back to school, and he'd be mad at me for forgetting my lunch to begin with. No, if I want to eat, I'm going to have to break a few rules. I decide to sneak off campus. My house isn't that far, it's a 15-minute walk, which would be a, about a five-minute run, and I could be back for Ancestor Club before Davery even notices I'm late. Well, not too late, anyway. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. I decide the best escape route is out the side exit and across the baseball field. It's not a foolproof way. Sometimes a few kids hang out there, the ones who like to ditch classes, but they usually stay behind the bleachers. If so, they'll be easy to avoid. Oh, no such luck today. Near the backstop behind the home plate, I think I spy Adrian Cuddlebush, the bully who gave Mac a black eye. He's there with his friends laughing about something. I skirt the field, hoping he's too busy showing off to notice me. If it were any other time, I'd stop and give him a piece of my mind. 
Once I'm free of the school grounds, I break into a jog. I don't mind running. I may not be as good at team sports as I want to be, but I'm a pretty good long-distance runner. I don't get tired easily, and it feels good once my blood starts moving and I shake off that initial sluggishness. I check my watch, 11.52 a.m. My house comes into view in eight minutes flat. I'm so busy thinking about my impressive running time that I almost don't register the big black SUV parked in front of my house. As soon as I notice it, I pull up short and look around for cover. The only hiding place is my neighbor's overgrown chamisa bush. I duck down behind it, but then I remember I'm mildly allergic to chamisa. Great. I can feel a sneeze coming on, but I pinch my nose to hold it back. My dad's car is in the driveway. Why is he home in the middle of the day? I hear a door slam. My front door? I peek around the bush and my stomach drops. There's Mr. Charles on his smartphone, striding away from the house. So much for him going back to Oklahoma. Close behind, Mr. Rock is rolling a trunk on a dolly. Ms. Bird clicks the key fob and the SUV's back pops open. Mr. Rock heaves up the trunk and pushes it into the car. Where's my dad, I wonder? Careful, Mr. Charles says absently as Mr. Bird opens the back seat door for him. We don't want to damage the merchandise. Merchandise? What kind of merchandise does an oil executive need? Then I get a sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. Maybe they're robbing us. Mr. Charles turns back to his phone conversation. The boy won't be a problem. He fell right into my hands last night. We should be able to secure him easily enough. Secure him? The girl, however. He means me. She recognized me from the beginning. Takes after her mother, a real fighter. But if her father asks her to come along peacefully, she'll comply. He climbs into the car and Ms. Bird slams the door closed. Little puffs of yellow chamisa pollen drift down into my face. I grab for my nose a second too late. Achoo! I freeze, wincing. Ms. Bird could have hurt. She's still outside the car. I wait for a second. Then I peek around the corner, and sure enough, Ms. Bird is staring right at my shrub. Don't notice me. Don't notice me. Mr. Charles rolls down his window and leans out. Is there a problem? He demands impatiently. I thought I heard. She cocks her head to the side, listening. You thought? Mr. Charles snaps. Well, that's your first problem. I don't pay you to think. I pay you to know. So do you think you heard something or do you know? Ms. Bird's eyes narrow. I hold my breath and my nose. Well, he demands again, irritated, I don't have all day. It was nothing, sir, she says, turning abruptly. She climbs back into the driver's seat. I breathe a sigh of relief. That was close. I, I hear the engine start up, and then, with screeching tires, the SUV pulls away from the curb. Once it turns the corner, I sprint to my house. I open the screen door to find that the front door is unlocked. I push it in as gently as I can, but the hinges still make a squeak that seems loud in the hushed afternoon. Dad, I call. Nobody answers. I hope they didn't, didn't knock him out or tie him up or something. I run through the house looking for Dad and checking to see what's missing. But everything is in its rightful place, except for my father. The realization hits me like a punch to my gut. Dad was in that trunk. Did they kill him? No, no. Charles said they were going to use Dad to make me comply. But was he drugged? Hurt? Where were they going, going with him? 
I wish I had taken down the SUV's license plate number. I feel panicky and my hand shakes uncomfortably as I pick up the landline. I'm just about to punch in 911 when I imagine the conversation. Emergency services, name and address, please. Nujoni, how do you spell that? Your father's been kidnapped by his boss, you say? A monster? Well, we all have problems at work, honey, but who are the police going to believe? Some random brown kid? Or a famous executive with his blonde hair and a fancy suit that reeks of money? No adult is going to buy this story. I've got to take down Mr. Charles on my own. There is someone who might help. The only one who seemed to know anything about fighting monsters. I rush to my room, head straight for my bookcase, and feel around the top shelf until my hand closes around a plush horned toad. I pull him out. Mr. Yazzie, I say, my voice shaking. If you're real and not just a dream, please wake up. I'm in trouble. The monster I was telling you about, he took my dad and said he's going to kidnap me and my little brother too, or maybe just kill me. I shake Mr. Yazzie gently, but nothing happens. My breath is coming hot and fast, and I want to cry, but I won't. This is a time to be strong. I'm still wearing my backpack, and I place Mr. Yazzie in the big outside pocket. Might as well bring him along for luck. My stomach grumbles, reminding reminding me why I came home. I'll need my strength if I'm going to have to deal with these monsters. My lunch bag is still on the counter, right where I left it. It's lying on its side like someone knocked it over. I pick up the bag and the apple rolls out, a red delicious. Dad loves them, but he knows I can't stand them. Why would he pack one in my lunch? I pick up the offending fruit and I'm about to set it back on the counter when I see it, carved into the apple. The yellow flesh showing through the red skin is one word, run. My feet feel unsteady, and my head gets a floaty feeling. I blink several times, take a deep breath, and look again. Sure, I imagined it, but the word is still there. R-U-N. Run. My dad left me a secret message. Through the still-open front door, I hear the rumble of a car engine outside. I look out the screen door to see that the black SUV has returned. And Mr. Charles is getting out of the back seat. I forgot the photo. I'll just be a minute, he says to Ms. Bird. And he jogs towards the house. The photo. The one he was so interested in yesterday of Mac and me with my mom and dad. I don't get why it's so important to Mr. Charles. He probably wants to use it to track us or something. All I know is that there's no way I'm letting him get his dirty hands on it. I run to the mantel and grab the picture frame. I hear the screen door opening. I race for the back door, dropping the apple as I go. I fly out into the yard just as the screen door closes. I vault the rear fence and race down the alley to school, my breath loud in my ears and my monster senses tingling. I don't stop and I don't look back. And that's the end of chapter 10. Thank you for tuning in. Join us next time for chapter 11 of Race to the Sun. Good night, Flagstaff.